Welcome to Worship at Bethany, everybody. We're thrilled that you're here today. Hey, um, I just want to give a hand to everybody who is up here. These are all volunteers up here who were singing, and they really um, did a great job. Would you do me a favor and just give them a hand? They're back there. They know where we're here. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Hey, the driving idea in this series we're in is that the events surrounding the trial of Jesus are are recorded to show us that we are the ones that are actually on trial. That in these stories, we should see ourselves and they should make us consider how we respond to Jesus. This week, I wanna show you how the primary characters involved in the trial itself represent us and uh, how different ways that people respond to Jesus. I also wanna show you that uh, this trial was very much a sham, it was unjust, it was unfair, the things that happened. While we don't have time to read through the whole narrative, I want you to be sure to come on back um, for Monday, Thursday, Good Friday to hear the whole story. Uh, But we're gonna talk about it today that way. And you know, this is not the only time that Jesus has been put on trial, maybe you don't know this, but um, I saw an article, it was in 1970 that somebody put Jesus on trial, Uh, believe it or not, uh, Arizona lawyer lawyer Russell Tanzi filed a suit against Jesus to the tune of $100,000 of damages because Uh, His secretary's house was damaged uh, due to lightning and the insurance company wouldn't cover the payments because they chalked it up to the act of God. And so Tansy said that, well, I'll just sue Jesus. I'm not kidding, it's real. He said in this article that he thought he had a strong chance of winning because he was pretty sure the defendant would fail to show in court. Okay, well, Thankfully, that case was thrown out, and I'm pretty sure you don't want to find yourself in the courtroom opposite of Jesus Christ, because, you know, I think uh, the cross uh, examination would be kind of brutal, don't you think? Um, but, but we're going to talk about the trial in front of us that we're talking about, uh, Jesus' trial, and there are six injustices that I want to walk through, six injustices that occurred at the, tri- at the trial. So, number one. The timing was unjust. The timing was unjust. Jesus' trial took place in middle of the night uh, with the first phase occurring at Caiaphas, the high priest's home, sometime around midnight. Now, Jewish law said that the trials could only occur during the day so that the trials could be public and so um, be open to scrutiny. Furthermore, trials were not allowed to take place on feast days because on feast days, people were traveling and they were distracted. Uh, And Jesus' trial occurred in middle of the Passover feast. In our day, that would be like Jesus being arrested late Christmas night, uh, Christmas Eve night, and then his trial being held at 2 a.m. in the morning. You just know something was up. Something sinister was afoot. Uh, So number one, the timing was unjust. Number two, the due process experience was unjust. The Jewish Sanhedrin, which was the council of the highest ranking Jewish, Jewish officials, they were like Israel's Supreme Court. And they were supposed to be impartial judges in capital cases. And they'd listen to the accusations and they'd listen to the defense and weigh the evidence fairly. But in Jesus's case, they're the ones who are making the charges. You can see how that might be a problem, right? Imagine you were in a courtroom where the judge came down from his seat and from his bench and led the prosecution and then went back into his chair. It's doubtful that he could be impartial. Plus, official charges were never actually brought against Jesus. From the moment he was brought in, he was just kind of blasted with a bunch of questions and when he didn't answer the way they wanted him to answer, they simply just punched him in the face. So the due process experience was unjust. Number three, their use of witness, witnesses was unjust. According to the Jewish law, all the witnesses had to agree on the particular details of the crime. And if not, the case would be thrown out. And if the witnesses were found to be lying, they would receive the punishment that the accused was supposed to receive, which kind of raised, you know, raised the bar a bit, raised the stakes a bit. Well, in Jesus' trials, the Sanhedrin kept looking for witnesses, which was highly inappropriate since they were the ones who were supposed to be the judges. And they couldn't really find any, and the few that they did find kept contradicting them each other, which means their testimony should have been thrown out. 
Number four, the conviction process was unjust. The conviction was supposed to take place by vote. The practice was that they would vote in order of the youngest to the oldest, so the youngest wouldn't be pressured or persuaded by the oldest. Uh, To carry out an execution, the sentence had to be unanimous, and no vote ever took place. And we know that some of the Sanhedrin, like Nicodemus, objected um, to the whole thing. Furthermore, Pilate twice gave a verdict of innocence, and that was completely ignored. Number five, the sentencing was unjust. Jewish law required that a sentence of death uh, be carried out by stoning. And the stoning was to be done by the accusers. Think about that. I mean, if you thought that they were worthy to die, then you were the one to throw the stones. You were the one that had to kill them, which again, kind of raised the stakes. Plus, the judgment had to sit on the table for three days So, and in those three days, uh, the Sanhedrin were supposed to fast and pray to make sure that the decision that, that was being made was the correct decision, and for witnesses to bring other pieces of evidence forward if there were other pieces of evidence. After three days, if none had come forward, that's when they would carry out the stoning. So the sentencing was unjust. Six, Pilate's final consent was unjust. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, but he was unwilling to act on it. He knows he's being manipulated by the Jewish leadership. At first, he comes up with what he thinks is a pretty ingenious uh, solution. He appeals to the Jewish custom whereby they would release a political prisoner, uh, but the crowd chooses Barabbas. In fact, chapter 27, verse 24 Uh, says this, that in order to avoid a riot, Pilate consented. 24, Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing, and so he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. So Pilate here tried to absolve himself of the guilt by washing his hands, which was a Jewish symbol, not a Roman symbol, saying to them he knew that Jesus was innocent, Um, But, of course, Pilate couldn't absolve himself that easily. So the bottom line is, this whole process was unjust. Why? There were two reasons. God was demonstrating for us in no uncertain terms that Jesus' death was not brought about by his sins, but by the sins of another. That it was my trial that he was undergoing. And two, Jesus in his trial was identifying with every one of us who have had to undergo injustice. Identifying with every one of us who have had to um, undergo or have ever been betrayed or overlooked or abused or mistreated. He knows what that's like. And And he entered into it to show us that he stood with us and that he was promising one day to redeem us from it. And that's the good news. That's the hope we have. That Jesus endured something that was completely unfair, completely unjust, so that we would receive something that we didn't deserve and that we didn't earn. And that's the hope that we have in the gospel. That is still relevant for us today. The question might be then, how might we respond to this good news? How might we respond downstream to what Jesus has done for each of us and all of us. Well, let me point you in the direction of a few of the characters in this story um, and see if you see yourself in any of these characters. Let me point out just three, and there's more. The first is the Sanhedrin. Let's call them the threatened, the threatened. Chapter 27 says that the Sanhedrin hated Jesus because they were envious of his popularity and the authority that Jesus uh, had, and they It was the kind of authority that they desperately wanted to have. His presence meant meant that they couldn't have things their way, and so they got rid of him. Now, it's tempting for us to simply shake our heads and say, man, that is awful. I would never have done that. But maybe that's because you simply have never been pushed to a point where you actually have to choose between Jesus and yourself as Lord. 
See, I can stand here and, and, and tell you all that Jesus demands absolute control over your life, and, and you can listen to me, and you can nod, and then you can leave here and simply not think about it again. You can even shake my hand on the way out and say, nice message, but you can leave Jesus here at, at the building. But what if you were actually pushed to the point that Jesus and your control over your life could not coexist together, that it had to be one or the other. Which one would you choose? I think I know which one I would choose if I'm going to be honest, because somehow, some way, we're raised to look out for ourselves first. It was explained to me once this way. It was explained this way, that in every heart, there is a throne and a cross. Uh, and, and, and if self is on the throne, then Jesus is on the cross. And if Jesus is on the throne, then our self must be on the cross. You see, Scripture says that to ignore the cause of the lordship of Christ is the same in God's eyes as consenting to his execution. You are in only one of two postures in relationship to Jesus right now, either surrender to him or in rebellion, either on your knees in worship or with your fist raised in the air saying crucify him. Which one of these two describe you? Which one of these two describe me? And here's a hint, nobody's completely innocent. So the Sanhedrin, Here, here's the, another character, Barabbas. Let's call Barabbas the spared. Scholars point out that Barabbas' name is an odd name because in the, it's very generic. A bar in Aramaic means son of, Abbas means father, so Barabbas' uh, name means son of a man. Barabbas is supposed to represent every man, every woman. Like Barabbas were rebels against the rule of God, Jesus, a man of perfect goodness, died in our place. He took the cross intended for us, which also helps us understand why Jesus was silent. Why did he remain silent through the whole trial? Why did Jesus refuse to answer the charges that were presented to, against him? Any judge will tell you that when you remain absolutely silent in the face of accusation and make no defense, defense that you're conceding guilt. But Jesus wasn't guilty of what they were accusing him of, so why then did he remain silent? Because Jesus perceived um, behind Caiaphas's pointing finger, the finger of his father pointing at him, accusing him of Barabbas' sin and our sin. And it was an accusation, accusation he willingly took. He pleaded guilty in my place for my guilt. You know, one of the curious things about the character of, and what happened with Barabbas is that we never really find out what happened to him. We never find out how he responded to Jesus. We, we, we don't hear whether he, whether he goes and goes back to Jesus and says, thank you so much, I owe you everything. And that's because his story is told to us as a question. What will we do? Will we fall on our knees and worship in gratefulness or pass, pass on casually, ignoring the one who died in our place? So that's our second character, Barabbas. And then I want to talk about Judas, the despairing. And I know I talked about Judas a couple weeks ago, but it's odd that the story of Judas shows up in midst of this trial. It almost seems out of place. Why, why would the recording of what happened to Judas suddenly emerge in middle of the recording of the trial uh, because it breaks up the complete flow of events. I think it's there to show us how tragic Judas's suicide was. When Judas realized how wrong he had been for what he had done, he, if you remember, he tried to give the money back, but he couldn't, and he probably assumed he could never be forgiven, that, was, that there was no hope but how wrong he was about that. I mean, how do we know? Well, Peter also had betrayed Jesus. In fact, every one of the disciples had forsaken him. 
each of them would be forgiven. But Judas still didn't grasp, and he wasn't able to understand that Jesus came to reclaim ruined people, that Jesus came to reclaim ruined lives, which is why I call him the despairing. He didn't believe he could be forgiven. He doesn't understand that Jesus' death, as awful as it was, was done for him too. That he was worth it in the eyes of God and in the eyes of Jesus. He didn't understand that what he did, even though it was so bad, Jesus still loved him, that he was willing to die and save him and restore him. Some of you, I believe, are in the same place. You think that you have done too much damage. You think maybe you've made too many mistakes in your life. You think you're maybe at a point in your life where there's too much that has happened and therefore God isn't interested in you any longer of using you for anything significant in his kingdom, in this life, on this side of heaven. You don't, you don't believe you have any hope. And you're sitting here this morning with a quiet sense of despair, perhaps. Maybe not over some kind of moral failure. Maybe it's some uh, health failure. Maybe it's some kind of relationship failure. Maybe it's some kind of career or dream failure. Like there's nowhere to go and there's nowhere to turn. Perhaps like Judas, some of you are literally on the cusp of wanting to take your life. You need to see that Jesus never gives up on you. You need to see that Jesus never grows tired of extending grace upon grace upon grace to you. You need to see that his power to restore your life in this world is is far beyond what you ever could imagine for or hope for. See, believing in the gospel is coming to realize that you're more broken than you ever dreamed and you're more loved and accepted than you ever dared hope. But Judas couldn't perceive that. He felt hopeless, like there was nowhere to turn, but there was. In three days, Jesus was going to get out of the grave with the power to forgive, with the power to restore, with the power to make all things new. Imagine if Judas had waited three or four more days to see what God was up to, to give God a chance. I mean, imagine if Peter found him and Judas had said, Peter, there's just simply no hope for me. I betrayed Jesus and there's no coming back from that. And Peter would have said, oh, but there is because I betrayed Jesus as well. And Peter would have said, uh, um, and and that's why Jesus was dying. He was dying for us, for me and for you and for all of us who betrayed Jesus. And then his resurrection, Through his resurrection, he's forgiving you and me. And Judas, I think Peter would say, Jesus is looking for you. What are you hiding for? He wants to forgive. He wants to restore. And you've been despairing. And I wonder if some of you are in the same place, that he's looking for you as well. Maybe it's time to take God a little more seriously. That not only is he looking for you, he's looking for you not to get you back, but to win you back and bring you back. And I think this all leaves us with a question. Is it time for you to put Jesus back on the throne of your life? Are you, is it time to stop worrying about the things that are uncertain that you can't control about the future, the circumstances that you can't control. Is it time to stop believing the lie that you're not worth enough for God to use in this world? That's the question that this unjust trial of Jesus leaves us with. And if you can put Christ back on the throne of your life, There still might be troubles, but you will begin to be able to face them in a new way because bigger than your troubles is going to be the 
presence of God in your life. And bigger than your failures is God's power to use those failures in a way that's going to bring a sense of meaning and purpose. And what's going to happen when you put Christ back on the throne of your life is you're going to begin once again to grow from the inside out and that grace and that peace and that love will be something that will accompany you and you will begin to live a life that you're gonna be able to look back on and be able to tell the story that you're proud about. That's God's call for you in the question. So let's take a moment to pray and before we come to this meal, as we open up our hearts and minds once again to take ourselves out of the center and put Christ in the center. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, the, the, the things that your son faced, we can really not wrap our minds around. But what we do know is um, the promise that you've given us, that if we can take a step into that promise, you're gonna show up in a way that will provide the warmth of love, the warmth of joy, and your assurance for us from here on out. For everybody in this room who's just simply been going through the motions, Lord, I pray you break them open once more to your spirit. In your name, amen.